Hello and welcome to On the Record. I'm Shireen Bhan. My guest today is the CEO of a company that is the third largest pharma company in India. In fact, the stock has been an outperformer up 8% year to date versus the pharma index, which is down 11% in the same period. The company has come a long way from the first big global breakthrough in 2001 when it introduced an HIV combination drug for less than a dollar a day, a game-changing development for HIV therapy. And today, CIPLA hopes to transform itself into a global health care organization with a sharp focus on strengthening its presence in the U.S. market in the complex generic peptides and respiratory segments. Well, to talk about the pipeline and CIPLA's plans ahead, joining me now is Umang Bora, the Global Managing Director and CEO. Umang, always a pleasure. Many thanks for joining me here on the record. Let me start by asking you about the growth aspiration, Umang. Uh, you say that you want to position CIPLA as a global healthcare organization. You've identified certain engines of growth, whether it's the wellness-oriented business, it's betting on new therapies, it's a diagnostic business, uh, and of course your continued leadership in the respiratory segment and a focus on the U.S. market. Of these, take me through the key milestones that you hope to achieve uh, in the next few years. What's the roadmap? Thank you, Shireen, for having me. And uh, it's a very comprehensive question. Let me attempt to answer it. Um, I think the, the broadly the three or four uh, drivers for us. The first is just in this healthcare diversification. We see a lot of markets like India, uh, but that also means that India will get uh, the largest amount of focus uh, in terms of the market that we want to create here. And what we're seeing in India is, is incredible amounts of deepening of the healthcare market into tier two and six towns. Uh, we are seeing a wave towards wellness. Um, and both of these are opportunities that we want to capitalize, not just for India, but also for the rest of the markets across the world. Uh, so that will be growth driver number one for us, which is just the deepening of the presence uh, of healthcare in India uh, and the evolve, evolving consumer healthcare space. Um, I think in the US, which is a, which is a very large market for us, we continue to see the benefit of our respiratory pipeline and our peptide pipeline de deepening there. This is part of our core business. Uh, but at the same time, we're also looking at new innovation uh, and R&D that can perhaps take us uh, into new areas like biosimilars, into areas like the mRNA uh, and other areas and therapies, which frankly COVID brought to the fore more significantly um, than, than before. So that's the second area uh, that we're looking at. The third area is a lot of the emerging markets where we think that uh, we might be at an inflection point right now, uh, considering where the world's been in the last two years. I think things are beginning to bottom out uh, for a lot of these markets. They've all taken a deep hit, um, and we see uh, you know, early signs of revival. So all these three parts of the world, um, I think the two big engines that are running uh, is, of course, going to be innovation. Um, um, and maybe a large amount of deflation enablers such as digital uh, in our business journey. You know, I want to pick up on each of those. And let me start by addressing the wellness segment that you spoke of. And as you pointed out, you have aspirations of building that out even further. Uh, how much of that is going to be driven in organically? Uh, is that an active discussion uh, that you're having with potential players at this point in time? Uh, and what would the size be of that business? And what kind of investments do you hope to make within that space? So we have very large organic brands in the wellness space, and our objective would be to grow and deepen these uh, organically first. Of course, inorganic is a part of the strategy, uh, but I think if you look at just the, the depth of our organic brands, we have several brands which are 200 odd crores big. Uh, the total business right now is about 600 crores. We can see this business growing uh, on the health side itself to close to about two and a half, three thousand 3,000 crores over the next five years. Um, so we are very bullish about consumer wellness. Uh, I think this is a business that will require us to be a lot more D2C oriented as well, uh, in addition to creating equity for these brands with doctors and with patients. Um, so we have large number of brands in the pain space. We have a large franchise um, in the vitamin space. We are the leaders in the nicotine replacement therapy. Um, and over a period of time, we will create more brands uh, in the cough segment, we will create more bands in the mom and children segment. Uh, and I think we feel very bullish about this category in India. 
Okay, uh, uh, and you continue to believe that you will be able to enter these new spaces that you spoke of within the wellness space, mom and children, for instance, organically or inorganically? What is going to drive the growth there from the 600 crores currently to about the two and a half, three thousand 3,000 crores that you aspire to over the next five years? We think organically we can reach about 1,500 crores uh, just out of the current portfolio that we have, uh, or possibly even more than that. Uh, and the rest of it would come through new introductions uh, in all these other segments that we spoke about. But also there would be an inorganic lift to this business too. We believe that out of the last five years or seven years, we've demonstrated how to build bigger brands and how to experiment with these brands in different store formats, uh, whether they are online or they are the offline, um, offline grocer stores, offline chemist stores, uh, as well as all the modern trade channels. Uh, so I think that's what's probably going to drive this. The doctor equity that Cipla has in the country allows us to brand our products and for them to be received uh, appropriately with the, by different audiences. Uh, let me then talk about the India story because you said that you continue to uh, believe that growth is going to come in from uh, the non-metros, from the smaller towns as well. What is that going to mean? If you can quantify that for me. Uh, today, the uh, India opportunity for you is about 45% of sales, up 27% year on year. What's the five-year roadmap as far as uh, India is concerned? Well, we think India can possibly double from where it is today. We have about a 10,000 crore business uh, in India. We believe that that business has the potential to double in, in, in five years. And I think obviously it will be augmented with an organic play, but also organic, uh, organic consumption, if I was to say that. But, you know, let's look at the demographic factors for India. Um, we have very, very, so a couple of things have been enabled in uh, in, the Indian, in the Indian context. The first is just the birth of insurance uh, in the deep, it, it, through Ayushman Bharat and several other schemes. And this creates affordability uh, for a lot of procedures that used to sit outside of several families. So I think from a government side, this has been a very big boost. Um, the second is just the deepening of hospitals. Uh, if you were to travel uh, in the interiors of India about five or seven years back and you were to do the same trip today, you'd suddenly see a lot of hospitals, lots of clinics, lots of chemist stores um, coming up in these cities. And I think that's, you know, people don't need to travel necessarily to metros or tier one towns now to get treatment. They can hope to get it in the tier two towns and the tier three towns. So we see these as huge, huge enablers of growth uh, in this part of the country. So. I think it's going to, for us, India is likely to be a market that doubles hopefully in five years, aided inorganically as well. And that's the opportunity for us. So we're 45% of the sale. We're hoping to keep the same percentage constant uh, going forward as India begins to leap uh, as much as some of the other markets that we are, going to, that we are focused on. What do you see as the big challenges and the big risks? Uh, you know, you talked about the growth opportunities in India, but let me ask you the reverse question as the big risks and the challenges. Uh, of course, uh, price control and the changes in the regulatory environment, whether it is with fixed dose combinations or other issues, uh, what do you see as the big risks with respect to the India business? I think the big risk with the India business is largely going to be the organization of trade. Uh, and, of course, at any point in time, uh, policies by the government uh, which create a shift in the marketplace. So we can talk about both. I think the organization of trade in terms of what share of the business will be occupied by the big chains uh, is definitely a big risk. Uh, today, I, you know, we think it's about 10 percent. Uh, we'd like to believe this could become 20 or 25 percent of the overall business uh, in the next uh, five years, leaving a fairly substantial uh, leaving a fairly substantial portion of the business still in the, with the current mom and pop chemist stores. Uh, but that's one big, big risk because it has a, a pricing connotation to it uh, and a margin connotation to it. Um, I think the, the other big risk that I see is obviously any policy from the government uh, which, could create you know, which could create upheavals for the industry. And, uh, or, make, um, uh, or make it difficult for certain sections of operation. So I think those would be the two things that we'd be watchful for. Umang, I now want to focus on the U.S. business because part of the plans to uh, drive growth is going to be your renewed focus on the U.S. market. Take me through what the target is, what the pipeline for launches looks like, what you hope to add by way of size over the next few years. 
Our U.S. business is about 500 million, uh, and we are hoping that that business also could benefit significantly out of launches that are coming. Uh, we think that the launches of products that we've been public about in the asthma and the COPD space uh, are significant opportunities for us and for our size in the U.S. Um, we also look at the peptide trajectory of products that we've been able to partner, develop on our own, uh, which is also very significant. Each of these products could be very, very meaningful, almost to the extent of 10, 15 percent and upwards of our current base. So as we see a, a, you know, a range of products uh, which are there, uh, I think this business could significantly increase from the, from the current levels uh, to the levels that we think in five years. We think even this business has the potential of doubling uh, in size in the next five years or so. Mm -hmm. But how challenging is the pricing environment? You know, uh, your peers that I was speaking to said that, look, uh, pricing pressure is the reality that you have to live with. You cannot ignore it. And it's only expected to perhaps worsen, uh, given the administration's sort of uh, uh, very determined focus on ensuring that prices come down, uh, which may not necessarily impact Indian pharma as much. But what's the pricing environment uh, looking like at this point in time? And how much of a risk is that potentially going to be? So the pricing environment in the U.S. historically, if you were to go rewind back about 15 years, has always been the 0 to 5, 0 to 10 percent type of price erosion that happens every year. The market deflates. Uh, and I think what happens is the only way to offset that is through new product launches. Um, I think it works for us a little differently than the others, uh, Shireen, and the reason for that is that our business is a relatively lesser size. So if the business becomes a larger size, your innovation engine has to work that much harder to be able to get um, the same benefit in your top line to avoid what you're deflating through pricing. Uh, so I think we don't have the same problem over the next three to four years. We, of course, have to erode pricing every year uh, because of the nature of the market. But we don't have that significant a challenge over the next three to four years. Uh, but if you're asking me four years and beyond, would our challenges be roughly the same as what the rest of the industry faces? Probably yes. And that's when the innovation engine will continue to have to fire at a different level, a different speed. And maybe there would be more types of products like biosimilars that would enter, uh, that would enter our portfolio at that point in time. You know, since we're talking about the innovation cycle that you intend to focus on and you just uh, spoke about biosimilars, uh, what about uh, things like the potential tie-up with Moderna as far as the COVID vaccine was concerned? Take me through what the bets, the new bets are likely to be as you look at uh, future-proofing CIPLA. I think we, we did have the discussions with Moderna uh, and uh, unfortunately those, those can't go forward because of various factors that were involved at that point in time. Uh, but we are in active discussions uh, you know, with several companies that have mRNA based technologies and the objective is not to get a vaccine for COVID or a vaccine for a specific product but rather being able to bring that technology uh, and res research with it and then manufacture with it uh, out of India. Uh, so that is what we're focused on. Uh, that's one area that we're looking at. The other area is areas of CAR-T, uh, which are now becoming the preferred treatment for cancer and several other indica indications. And the objective is that we look at the presence of these technologies and the presence of the products that come from these technologies within India. We'd like to imagine our role as that as a role of an innovator. And I think that is the, that is the promise that we would like to make to India and what we're trying to get to uh, as, as a positioning for CIPLA within the India market and some of the other emerging markets of the world. Welcome back. You're watching On The Record. I'm Shireen Bhan. We're in conversation with the Managing Director and Global CEO of CIPLA, Umang Bora. You know, given the, the focus that you just spoke of, uh, especially as far as innovation is concerned, you said that you're speaking uh, with the players uh, to potentially bring mRNA technology to India. You're looking at the CAR-T opportunity as well. Uh, any timelines by when you believe that this could start to have a meaningful impact as far as financials are concerned? And what kind of uh, fresh investments are we uh, expected to make in terms of betting on these new segments? So we're looking at roughly three to five years as a minimum to have um, from concept to product. So we're looking at three to five years if we start today to when we could have a first product in India. Uh, and of course, for the regulated markets, it's going to be significantly beyond that. But our focus right now is all India for some of these products. 
And the type of investments would be, you know, our assumptions say that it could be somewhere in the 50 to $100 million range uh, in terms of non-CapEx investments. And if you were to add CapEx, maybe another 50, $70 million more. So completely within, uh, within range of how we would look at our business and the investment cycle. Uh, it's, not, it's not significantly beyond that. Okay, uh, so about 50 to 100 million non-CapEx, uh, that's the kind of broad investment range that you're looking at. You know, you brought up emerging markets as another engine of growth that uh, you will focus on. What could the contribution be in terms of revenue over the next three to five years? Uh, what is it that you're working with in terms of the target? So we've deep markets in South Africa. We've got uh, good presence in some of the other markets of the emerging side of the world. But we're primarily looking at Brazil. We're looking at China. We're looking at South Africa. Uh, within these set of markets, Australia, we call it the, an emerging market for us. But Australia is, you know, hopefully will be a $100 million, $100 million market for us pretty soon. Uh, we're looking at Brazil. Uh, China is a market that we believe the respiratory opportunity is fairly significant. I don't think we're going to do uh, the China market as a market where we'd sell by ourselves, but through a partner. Uh, but we've identified these deep markets, which hopefully have more stabler, uh, stabler economies and less volatility. Uh, so it's going back, in a sense, to the entire classification of you know, the same Brazil, South Africa, China, uh, you know, deep, deep, deeper markets, larger number of people, uh, those are the markets that we are after. So I think the contribution from the, the emerging markets would stay. We have roughly about 30%, uh, uh, about 25% of our mix. That's probably going to stay uh, at the same level of mix as we go forward. I think if it might dial down a bit because of the significant growth that we probably will see out of India and the U.S., uh, but it's a very important third leg for us uh, in our business strategy. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, since you're talking about building on a culture of innovation, which is going to be key to driving your business strategy, I also want to understand from you what changes you're making to ensure that the organization moves in that direction. Culturally, the changes that you're making to ensure that the business strategy is aligned with what's happening on the back end. It's a, it's a great question. It's a great question. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of thinking about this. Um, I think one of the first things we've realized is that our own culture and value statement has to have innovation as a central value. Uh, we have that. But what we don't have is we don't have what that innovation links back to. So what we've, you know, tried to look around and we've come up with uh, a terminology called pioneering, which is really about how we could take something that comes from CIPLA beyond uh, into the industry. And we said we have to pioneer a lot of these things, whether it's about bringing technologies into India and coming out with products uh, or even otherwise. So that's the first thing that we've done. We've started speaking about innovation internally significantly. We've also started talking about how we could continue to be pioneers uh, for the industry, for the people going forward. So that's the first cultural change. The second is, uh, you know, we're trying to look at, uh, we, we spend a lot more into innovation uh, we're beginning to have a relook at how we center around innovation. So, for example, we're okay now to have decentralized teams uh, sitting in the U.S., sitting in Europe, where we believe a significant innovation quotient exists. Right? It's very difficult to build innovation ecosystems uh, in you know if, in in a new place. So for example, for a lot of innovators who are based out of San Francisco, a lot of innovators who are based in Europe, it's very difficult to attract them to come and work. Uh, in India. So what we're trying to do is to you know, create a structure where they primarily exist in their countries but, uh, and we perhaps open a few decentralized centers for innovation in, around the places that they live and try and merge that back with our mother organization um, within, within India. So I think those are, some of the, uh, so those are some of the things that we're looking at. The other thing is alliances. Uh, I think a lot of innovation happens outside a single lab. It happened outside this lab for a large number of pharmaceutical companies in the world as well. And it's the same for us. So the right alliances, the right structures, the right people in de decentralized locations, uh, culturally espousing certain values, all of that's coming together. It's not an easy fix. Um, it's very differ different to innovate versus very different to be a generic company. And you can't begin to exclude either of the two. The generic company is what's going to pay for innovation for us. So, and the generic company's mentality is structured around cost and access. 
Uh, and the innovation mentality is really about being able to get products which are ahead of the curve, uh, which has the patient at the center and the ability to satisfy the patient need. Uh, so there are two organizations and we have to properly structure them, marry them uh, in, in order to get the best outcome for the company. No, I understand that, uh, and uh, and it's interesting that you're talking about uh, building alliances in order to be able to create these innovation ecosystems. But Umang, what is that going to mean in terms of spends? Uh, you know, what is the current spend, and what do you anticipate the spend to be over the next few years as you enhance your focus on innovation? We're currently about six percent, uh, and I think that going forward, we could. We, two things would happen. We'd obviously continue to be 6% of a certain base that hopefully would grow uh, on the top line. But we are also thinking of increasing our innovation spends to close to 7 to 8%. And I don't think in the way we look at our business model today that we can ever be higher than 8% considering uh, the needs of our stakeholders and you know what we think we can productively spend on. Uh, so I do think innovation spends in the company will increase um, from on the R&D side, from 6% to closer to, to closer to between seven and eight. But we're also innovating on our business model. Uh, the, the whole digital wave is effectively trying to allow us to pass, to mitigate the increase of inflation in the economy. Uh, so digital is wonderful because on the business model side, it allows you to get into lots of adjacencies at much cheaper cost. So the cost of acquiring a customer or the cost of detailing to a doctor on a digital platform is almost one third or one fourth the cost that it would take for a usual platform. So I think we're trying to innovate across not just the labs, but also a business model through the digital engine. Yeah, and, and I think that that is a journey that many companies and corporations are on at this point in time. Uh, Umang, I, I want to understand from you, uh, since you talked about uh, focusing on growth largely organically, but you're also open to inorganic uh, acquisitions, uh, what could be the potential gaps that you hope that inorganic growth will plug? So I, I don't, I, I'm not sure, Shireen, that we have a number that we, I, we have an internal set of numbers that we want to get to, uh, but I don't think we look at where we want to get to to be satisfied because we have an X amount coming through an acquisition. Uh, I don't think we've planned our business that way, uh, but if, you know, I would think that we would want at least 10 to 15% of our revenues, let's say over five years later, to be from sources which have, we have acquired in, in, these five year, in this five year period. So yes, it's not going to be significant, but at the same time, uh, I, don't, I do think those acquisitions will bring new capabilities. I do think those acquisitions will allow us to be deeper either in markets or in territories in India. And I do think those acquisitions will be consumer heavy, whether they're in diagnostics or they're even in consumer brands that go deeper uh, in the countries that we operate in. You know, you talked about diagnostics, and uh, this is getting to be a very, very interesting space. Lots of activity, lots of action, not just from the incumbents, but from plenty of startups who are looking at getting into this. Your peers are uh, uh, exploring this opportunity as well, whether it's Lupin or Torrent. Uh, how big of an aspiration is the diagnostic business for you? So, uh, you know, I think it's, a, it's an extremely big enabler for our business in, in India and some of the emerging markets. And then, let me explain what our version of diagnostics is. We are not, we're not in the business of setting up diagnostic chains. We're not in the business of setting up diagnostic centers because we think that those are highly capital intensive uh, and fast commoditizing markets. But we are in the business of providing or trying to create solutions for diagnosis in doctors' rooms and chambers because that's where a large chunk of India uh, starting with the tier one to the tier four cities goes to, get di goes to get diagnosed and treated. And what happens usually is in this patient journey is when they go to this doctor, they then sent to another hospital or another lab or another place to get tested. And we think a lot of people drop off because of that. They either don't get tested or the cost that they spend in getting this test significantly increases. Uh, so our objective is to bring this diagnosis to the doctor's room in the doctor's chamber as phase one. And as phase two, it's really to take this entire thing to the patients directly. So which means if a patient can blow into a phone and gets an opinion of what their lung health looks like, 
or if a patient can look into the phone and gets a scan done which tells them what their blood pressure is and how it's behaved over the past week or so, I think that's the type of diagnosis that we are after, which brings it more centered to the people, um, either to the doctors or the patients themselves. Okay, so uh, not looking at pouring into the diagnostic chain or diagnostic center business. Uh, Umang, I kind of have an inkling of what your response to this question is going to be, but I'm going to ask it nevertheless because this keeps coming around. Uh, the possibility of CIPLA being put on the block, being up for sale. Uh, you know, the promoters have uh, a little over 33% stake in the company. Uh, you know, it keeps coming back uh, as a possibility and as a potential uh, or an eventuality. Has there been any conversation with the promoters on this aspect? No, not, none with the promoters, none with the board. In fact, we're at a stage where we want to be the consolidator. Uh, so there's been no conversation either with the promoters or with the board uh, on this aspect at all. Well, that's it then on On the Record with Umang Bora. We are going to take a break here on the CNBC TV 18 and be back with you in a moment with a lot more.